This is the first of two talks examining the positive doctrine of the church on the origin of Adam's body, both what she teaches and with what authority she teaches it. And by the end, I hope that you'll see that this thesis, that the bodies of our first parents were formed by an immediate act of God, Adam from the earth and Eve from his side, are actually Catholic dogma. They merit that note. So in the first talk, we'll be looking at this from scripture and tradition. And in the second talk, we'll be confirming what we found in part one from the church's response to evolutionism, primarily in the 19th and early 20th centuries. So for right now, we're going to lay out some theological scaffolding. That way we can actually assess the sources, see with what authority they teach what they do, and then we'll actually dive into the sources, scripture and tradition. Um, and I want to briefly apologize because I'm I love to try and get a great deal of theological precision. I think that's important to recover, but we're going to have to gloss over a lot of distinctions. So these are just the highlights. Okay, so first, what's a dogma? The First Vatican Council defines what a dogma is in its Constitution Dei Filius, saying, All those things are to be believed with divine and Catholic faith that are contained in the Word of God written or handed down, and which by the church, either in solemn judgment or through her ordinary and universal teaching office, are proposed for belief as having been divinely revealed. So that's what a dogma is. It's something to be believed with divine and Catholic faith. That is the theological virtue of faith. We can kind of break this definition down to two parts. You have corresponding to divine faith and Catholic faith. Divine faith means that something is revealed in the word of God, scripture and or tradition. Catholic faith means that it has been proposed by the church as revealed for our belief. And this can happen in one of two ways. Either in the church's solemn judgment, that's her extraordinary magisterium. This would be things like ex cathedra definitions by a pope or comparable by an ecumenical council. Or you have the ordinary and universal magisterium. And this one needs a little bit of unpacking because it's kind of tricky to understand. But both of these modes are infallible modes of teaching. So the teaching on the ordinary and universal magisterium goes back to uh, Blessed Pius IX's letter to us, Lebenter, and he was getting the phrase ordinary and universal magisterium from a Jesuit theologian, Josef Kloitgen, who we'll return to later. But then we have a very important clarification by the CDF, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, in 1998 that gives us a bunch more information about how this uh, manner of teaching operates. So, of course, the ordinary and universal magisterium is made up by all the bishops dispersed throughout the world in union with the Holy Father. So, it's universal, and it has to be. Um, one thing that this CDF document points out is that this mode of teaching is perhaps primarily diachronic. That means through time. Uh, theologians debate whether or not it can happen synchronically at one particular time. But this is important because this mode of teaching happens over the course of centuries, just the church's ordinary teaching and preaching. Next, a doctrine that is contained in the ordinary and universal magisterium can be confirmed or reaffirmed by the Pope without having to be solemnly defined. He can simply point to it and say, hey, look, that doctrine, that's in the ordinary and universal magisterium. And it can the ordinary and universal magisterium can be expressed in a variety of ways. Um, it can be expressed expressed explicitly, that's synchronically at one time, um, not a solemn definition. There's a distinction there between defined and not defined. It can be displayed implicitly in the practice of the faith. We think of the liturgy or paraliturgical rites, um, but primarily it's expressed by the uninterrupted tradition of the church, and this especially through the moral unanimity of the fathers and theologians, the unanimous consent of the fathers and theologians. That's really important. So we're going to unpack that a little bit. Who are the fathers and theologians? So the fathers, of course, are those Catholic authors who have antiquity, uh, orthodoxy, sanctity, and they've been recognized as the church by such. Um, there are also others who are ancient, but 
not technically saints or not technically that orthodox. So we just call them ecclesiastical writers, although often they're lumped into the fathers. These are guys like Tertullian and Origen. But then the theologians, um, they're a little harder to pin down, so I might use the definition by the great American theologian uh, Joseph Fenton. Uh, he says they're the Catholic authors who have achieved scientific accuracy in their exposition and treatment of Catholic doctrine. So we're primarily thinking of the scholastic theologians when we say this. Now, Vatican I, repeating and clarifying the teaching of the Council of Trent, tells us something about the unanimous consent of the fathers. It says, in matters of faith and morals, affecting the building up of Christian doctrine, that is to be held as the true sense of Holy Scripture, which Holy Mother of the Church has held and holds, to whom it belongs to judge of the true sense and interpretation of the Holy Scriptures. Therefore, no one is allowed to interpret the same Scripture contrary to this sense or contrary to the unanimous consent of the fathers. So much for back in one. So you see, there's this identification between what the Church herself holds and teaches and what the unanimous consent of the fathers holds and teaches here on the interpretation of Scripture. And then in Pius IX's To Us Labenter, which I mentioned a moment ago, he says something very similar about the theologians. He says that the submission of divine faith, so the virtue of faith, belongs not only to those matters taught by the extraordinary magisterium, but also extends to those things transmitted as divinely revealed by the ordinary magisterium of the whole church dispersed throughout the world, ordinary and universal magisterium, and for that reason, held by the universal and constant consensus of Catholic theologians as belonging to the faith. So again, there is this almost an identification between what the unanimous consent of the fathers and theologians teach and what the church herself teaches in this ordinary and universal mode. There's the same basic reasoning behind both of them. Now, of course, this has to be on a matter of faith. It has to be something of faith and morals. It can't just be any random thing that the fathers all agree upon. It has to be something revealed. Um, an important qualification, we're not looking for a, an absolute unanimity here. That would be basically impossible to establish. We only need a moral unanimity. As St. Vincent of Laran says, um, in his commentary, one of the most important patristic uh, documents on how tradition works. He says that we must adhere to the consentient definitions and determinations of all, or at least almost all. It doesn't have to be quite everyone. And Joseph Fenton explains further a bit why. We say morally all the fathers because the opposition of one or even of an inconsiderable number to the teaching which is common from the rest does not prevent the common teaching from enjoying a certain unanimity. This moral unanimity is all the more evident when a dissenting doctrine has been recognized and abandoned by all the patristic writers who came after the man who advanced it. Close quote. That's important because what we'll see with regard to the origin of our first parents and even the historicity of Genesis at all that's exactly what happens. Couple dissenting voices that were unanimously rejected by the later tradition, very clearly. And one last point. The sense in which dogmas have been understood can never change. There, of course, there's legitimate development of doctrine. We don't have time to get into that today. But the First Vatican Council defines that the meaning of the sacred dogmas is perpetually to be retained, which our Holy Mother of the Church has once declared, and there must never be a deviation from that meaning on the specious ground and title of a more profound understanding. And a bit later, it gives the anathema. If anyone says that, as science progresses at times, a sense is to be given to dogmas proposed by the Church different from the one that the Church has understood and understands, let him be anathema. So no evolution of dogma. Our understanding can certainly deepen and grow more profound, but as St. Vincent of Iran says, following 1 Corinthians 1.10, it must always be in the same sense and in the same judgment. Eodem sensu eademque sententia. Okay, so that's our theological scaffolding. Just return to our diagram. Remember that we're looking for something to be of divine faith. It's revealed in the word of God, scripture, and or tradition. And it has been taught by the church as such in one of two modes either her extraordinary magisterium or the ordinary and universal magisterium, 
And when we think of the ordinary and universal magisterium, we should think of the unanimous consent of the fathers and theologians. Okay, let's dive into the sources. So, like I said at the outset, we're going to be investigating a thesis that the bodies of our first parents were formed immediately by God, Adam from the earth, Eve from his side. But we're going to focus specifically on Adam. Why? Because the teaching regarding Eve is a lot more clear in the tradition um, for a variety of reasons. Um, what, for ex and even theistic evolutionists seem to recognize this. For example, uh, Delmas Leroy, or Lara, I think you say it in French, um, he said, and he was in favor of evolution, no believer could doubt that woman's body had been formed from that of Adam. Close quote. And we'll come back to him in part two. Ernst Messinger, who probably wrote the best theological treatment from a stance favorable to evolution, he said that, quote, It is our considered and definite belief that Eve was really formed from Adam. Indeed, this is so certain and so clearly taught in both sacred scripture and tradition that it may as well be de fide. Close quote. This is an evolutionist, one who did his homework, but... So we'll be focusing on Adam. Now, of course, the principal text for the creation of Adam's body comes from Genesis 2, and we'll put in context from Genesis 1. Genesis 1, and God said, let us make man to our image and likeness. And God created man to his own image. To the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And then Genesis 2, the Lord God had not rained upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the earth. But a spring rose out of the earth, watering all the surface of the earth. And the Lord God formed man of the slime of the earth and breathed into his face the breath of life and man became a living soul. So what Moses is doing here um, is going back and explaining more fully what was already contained there more generally in Genesis 1, focusing on man. And this is how all the fathers and theologians understand the relationship between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. As St. Basil the Great says, there, in Genesis 1, it says that God created. And here, in Genesis 2, how he created. And this is important because a lot of modern biblical scholars and certain high-ranking prelates will say that, no, they're, as Mike was saying last night, they're contradictory narratives stitched together from various authors, and it doesn't really say anything about how mankind was made. And of course, Basil isn't the only one who says this. A lot of other saints and theologians do as well. It, these are all persons, theologians, who say this explicitly. That's a recapitulation in greater detail. So how did God make man? Saint, uh, not saint, sadly, Cornelius Alapide, the great biblical scholar, he explains it for us in terms of Aristotelian causality. So Moses here, Genesis 2-7, assigns the five causes of man, and we're only concerned with the first two for our talk. The efficient cause is God. The material cause is the mud of the earth, or earth mixed with water. So the efficient cause, God formed man, as it says in Genesis, that corresponds to the immediate aspect of the thesis. And then the material cause, the slime or the mud of the earth. We'll look at both of these in turn. So first, the material cause. Adam's body was made from mud or clay, which is dust mixed with water. Um, this, it's very interesting because while the older manuscripts, the Hebrew, the Greek, even some of the old Latin versions, have the word God for man from the dust of the earth. So in Hebrew, it's afar. In the, um, Greek, it's kus. In Latin, it's pulvis. But the Vulgate has limus, which is mud, or the Dewey translates as slime. I'm going to translate it as mud here because it's a little more clear. Why is that? Have you ever tried to mold dust? There's no cohesion to it. You add water, and then it becomes something moldable. You like mold it like clay, and we'll see this come up over and over and over again. But this idea that Adam's body was made from dust, earthy dust plus water, goes back explicitly to at least Tertullian in the second century, although implicitly it goes back even further. And you can see St. Thomas says the very same thing. Um, St. Thomas, St. Augustine, St. Gregory the Great, Albert the Great, Blessed Denis of Carthusian, Cornelius Lapide, Suarez, and virtually all the theologians after Thomas will say explicitly that it was a mixture of earthy dust and water, terre aqua permixta. Um, 
Now, following Augustine, some of them will also say, like, like Thomas, that air and fire also went into the composition of Adam's body, but Moses left those out because they weren't as evident to the senses, and earth and water kind of predominate in the human body. And there's something true to this if you think about it. Solid, and there's liquid within us, but then there's also breath and heat. So there's some, there's some truth to that basic elemental understanding. But they're very clear about it's dust of the earth, earthy dust. That's the primary material then mixed with water. And we see this implicitly even earlier. For example, uh, Pope St. Clement of Rome, one of our first popes um, in the very first century, and St. Irenaeus of Lyon in the second century, they both refer to the matter or the substance from which Adam was made as mud or clay. And it's interesting, uh, Irenaeus is actually quoting Genesis 2-7 using the word for mud or clay, even though he's going from the Greek. And it's before the Vulgate. That's very interesting. And Irenaeus could even say that, quote, everyone will allow that we are composed of a body taken from the earth and a soul receiving spirit from God. And St. Augustine says, likewise, a couple centuries later, that, quote, there is no difference of opinion as to the original stock of the body. So while we know from history and from some of the fathers that Manichaeans, uh, certain philosophers in those days disagreed with our thesis, it seems that there was never any dissension among Catholics. There was always the same view. Adam was made from clay. With perhaps one notable exception, and we'll get to that a little later. So what about the rest of Scripture? Um, well, Genesis 2-7 is the first place in the order of the books where we get this revelation. It's not perhaps necessarily the first place that God revealed it to our first father. Because of course, Adam wasn't around to see his own creation. Rather, God solemnly affirms to Adam the matter from which he was taken when he's cursing him and sending him out of the garden. In the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread until thou return to the earth out of which thou wast taken. For dust thou art, and into dust thou shalt return. And, in case the reader didn't get the message, a little bit later it reads, And the Lord God sent him, Adam, out of the paradise of pleasure to till the earth from which he was taken. So notice here, there's an identification between the matter from which Adam was made, the matter which he tills, and the matter into which he returns after death. If those aren't all the same thing, these passages are unintelligible. But that's not the only place in Scripture. We actually get this affirmed many times. For example, in the Psalms, The Lord knoweth our frame. He remembereth that we are dust. And now, turning to wisdom, I myself am a mortal man, and like all others and of the race of him that was first made of the earth. Him who is first made of the earth, Adam. And again, in wisdom, idolaters are rebuked on the grounds that they're making idols of the very same material that they are made. And of the same clay by a vain labor he maketh a god, he who a little before was made of the earth himself, and a little after returneth to the same out of which he was taken. Ecclesiastes parallels Genesis 2.7, when it says, And the dust return into its earth from whence it was, and the spirit return to God who gave it, so soul and body. And St. Augustine will say that this is a most certain truth in one of his letters, and he explains how this parallels Genesis 2.7. In Sirach, all men are from the ground, or out of the earth, from whence Adam was created. And again, very clearly, God created man of the earth, and made him after his own image, and he turned him into it, earth, again. And that passage from Ecclesiasticus, from Sirach, is very often cited by St. Thomas and other scholastics, to prove this thesis. It almost needs no comment. But just in case we didn't get the memo, St. Paul adds, the first man was of the earth, earthly. And that word earthly there is very interesting. It's a unique Greek word. It only occurs at one place in the scriptures. And it's koikos. And its root is the Greek word for dust, kus. So it literally means one made out of dust. And again, the theologians often use this passage from 1 Corinthians to justify this thesis. So, moving on to the efficient cause. 
Adam's body was made by God. As St. Athanasius says, Adam was created alone by God alone through the word. Now, we need to clarify what we mean. We say Adam was made immediately by God. What does this mean? We mean that in a causal sense, not necessarily a temporal sense. So there's no intervening secondary efficient causes in the making of man. It was just God and the dust and the mud. So no evolutionary process also bringing the body into existence. Now, St. Thomas does say in his questions on the soul and in the Summa that it was simultaneous with the creation and fusion of man's soul. So it did all happen in an instant, but that's not technically what we mean when we say immediate. We mean more of a direct act. Now, there's this question of the activity of the angels. Do the angels cooperate in the making of man? And St. Augustine, St. Thomas, and a lot of theologians contain the idea that they did. So how does this reconcile with the whole immediate uh, formation thing? The angel, the following um, Matthew, Daniel, Job, we know that and at the end of time, the angels are going to gather together the bodies of all the human race from the four corners of the world, and all those bodies will have then have been reduced to dust and ashes. So if they'll, they're going to do that at the end of time, why not at the beginning of time? The formation of our first parent. But this isn't, they're not actually forming the body of Adam. They're just bringing the dust together into one place. You can maybe use the analogy of a dump truck. It brings all the dirt and stuff to the construction site, but doesn't actually do any of the building. That was God alone. So, St. Thomas, following St. Irenaeus, St. Cyril of Jerusalem, will say that this was a miraculous act. It was something intrinsically supernatural. Um, he compares it even to the incarnation. And this is important because there's a typology here. Just as Adam was made from virgin soil, which no man had tilled and no rain had fallen upon yet, so the second Adam was made from the Blessed Virgin. And this typology is noted by um, St. Ephraim, St. Irenaeus, Peter Chrysologus, and many others. And one last thing here about the efficient cause. The word for formed here in Genesis 2-7 is yatser. Now, both ancient and modern scholars recognize that this is what a potter does to clay. So you get the first hints of this analogy where God is a potter and we are clay. Well, I mean, we are clay, but... Scripture will often use the language of God's hands in this regard. And the fathers note this. Like, oh, well, of course, God doesn't have physical hands, not as God. So what does this mean? And they say, St. Irenaeus, St. Ambrose, St. Augustine, St. Thomas, St. Bede, St. Robert Bellarmine, and other theologians, they all say that God's hands refer to his power and his wisdom, or perhaps also the Son and the Holy Ghost in union with the Father. That's how they explain the anthropomorphism. So let's look at the efficient cause and the rest of scripture. In the book of Job, thy hands have made me and fashioned me wholly around about. Remember, I beseech thee that thou hast made me as the clay, and thou wilt bring me into dust. And Psalm 118 echoes this. Thy hands have made me and formed me. Now, a number of fathers like St. Hilary, St. Basil, uh, St. Thomas, and St. Robert Bellarmine will say that made here refers to God creating the soul. And formed or fashioned refers to God making the body. Also in Job, the Spirit of God made me, and the breath of the Almighty gave me life. Behold, God hath made me as well as thee, and of the same clay I also was formed. So you both here, God made man, and he made him out of clay. Turning to Isaiah, he prays, And now, Lord, thou art our Father, and we are clay. Thou art our maker, and we are all the works of thy hands. And this is very important. As Father has been pointing out this week, there is a connection between fatherhood and creation. And you see this subtly first here in Isaiah and a couple other passages where God's fatherhood is attached to the doctrine of our creation. For example, in Deuteronomy, Is not the Lord thy father that hath possessed thee and made thee and created thee? And his very next words, interestingly, Moses, are, remember the days of old. What days of old? Genesis? Likewise in the Psalms, know ye that the Lord, he is God. He made us. 
and not we ourselves. And you see this again in, like, in Luke's genealogy. It says that Adam was of God, God was his father. And St. Paul says, for we are also his offspring, God's offspring. And if we had time, we could actually look at the text of Genesis 2 and following and see how Adam is being made as a son of God, as God's vicar, if you will, his prince over creation. So going back to our potter analogy, this comes up uh, pretty frequently in the prophets. Isaiah says, for example, Woe to him that gainsayeth his maker, a shard of earthen pots. Shall the clay say to him who fashioned it? What art thou making? And thy work is without hands. Or if the Hebrew might also read, you have no hands. Woe to him that saith to his father, why begettest thou? And St. Paul will quote or at least reference this passage many times in his epistles. He's often referring to us as earthen vessels in which the treasure of sanctifying grace is placed. But our Lord has the last word, of course. He says to the Pharisees, Ye fools, did not he that make that which is without, the body, make also that which is within, the soul? So if you flip this around, since we know, it's of Catholic faith, that God immediately makes the soul out of nothing, that means he must also have made the body. Now, this, of course, is just the surface. There are many other passages in Scripture that allude with greater or less clarity to our first formation, that God alone did so, and that it, God made Adam's body from the earth. Now, the Scriptures are really explicit, as we've seen, and it's more significant than we might think. Remember how I mentioned that Pius IX was getting his doctrine or at least the, the terminology of the Ordinary and Universal Magisterium, from this Joseph Kloitgen, who's a very famous theologian. Leo XIII called him the Prince of Philosophers, and a number of his, his contemporaries called him Thomas Redivivus, Thomas brought back to life. They held him in pretty high esteem. So listen to what he says concerning the scriptures. He says that since the church and your Ordinary and Universal Magisterium proposes for our belief the entire scriptures as divine revelation, the inspired and errant word of God. Therefore, quote, as soon as we cannot doubt that something is contained in the scriptures, so we are also certain that this is taught by the church as revealed truth. So if a doctrine is clearly and explicitly taught in sacred scripture, it is ipso facto by the fact itself proposed as divinely revealed by the ordinary and universal magisterium. It's interesting, Leo XIII seems to agree in Providentissimus Deus Paragraph 14, uh, his encyclical on scripture, teaching that the human authors of sacred scripture can themselves give authentic interpretations to other passages. So, when Ecclesiasticus, Sirach says, God created man of the earth, and St. Paul says the first man was of the earth, earthly, literally one made out of dust, the holy authors themselves, under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, are giving an authentic interpretation to what is recorded in Genesis 2 and 3. I think this is at least enough to qualify our thesis as of divine faith, if not of Catholic faith. But we don't just want to look at Scripture. We also want to look at the tradition. And we also need to see that the fathers and theologians propose this, not just as any truth, but as a revealed truth. So we'll turn to that now. Tertullian gives us the first testimony. He says that God sent messengers into the world they might proclaim that there is only one God who made all things, who formed man from the dust of the ground. Now, if that God formed man's body from the dust wasn't of faith, God's messengers wouldn't have had to announce it as part of revelation. Therefore, it's revealed truth. Uh, St. Jerome is a little more forceful, as usual. Does anyone believe in God the Creator? He cannot believe unless he believes first that to be true which is written of his saints, that Adam was fashioned by God, that Eve was made out of a rib and from his side, and then he lists a bunch of other facts from Scripture. He who does not believe all these things and the others that have been written about the saints will not succeed in believing in the God of the saints. Moving on to St. John Chrysostom. He says that the words of Genesis 2-7 require the eyes of faith that they're beyond the limitations of our powers of reason. 
and that while one might think that this saying is incredible, that God made man from the dust, quote, if you recall who is the creator in this case, you will no longer withhold faith in the event, but marvel at the creator's power and bow your knee to it. God's power is manifest. This is a faith. It's an intrinsically supernatural, theological truth. And last but not least, St. Augustine, he says the same thing. We speak to faithful men who have learned to believe the inspired scriptures, even though no examples are adduced of actual reality. For how could I now possibly prove that a man was made from the dust without any parents and a wife formed for him out of his own side? Yet faith believes what the eye no longer discovers. Close quote. So what Augustine is saying here, and Chrysostom too, is that this is something intrinsically theological. God had to reveal this to us. No examples are adduced from actual reality, even if, which I don't think can happen, you could show that an evolutionary process is happening right now. Even if you could, you could never positively say that God did or did not act in a supernatural mode, turning mud of the earth into the human body just like that several thousand years ago. Science can't say anything about that. It had to be revealed to us. The best that science can give us is a just-so story, or what Plato called in the Timaeus a likely story. One interesting thing about this quote from Augustine I've yet to come across a scholastic author citing this with reference to our thesis, with reference to the doctrine of Adam's body. And that might be because the, his, this quote comes from his defense, not of creation, but of marriage, defending the existence of marriage before the fall. Some food for thought. Moving on to later theologians, later doctors. We've already seen some of St. Thomas's teaching. St. Bonaventure, his contemporary, says in the Breviloquium, true faith. Fide orthodoxe, orthodox faith, teaches us to hold the following about the body, the human body, and the original state of creation. The body of the first man, formed out of the dust of the ground, was created subject to the soul in proportion to it in its own way. Woman was formed out of the side of man. So that's the orthodox faith. Likewise, St. Albert the Great. We must say that as regards the body of the first man, according to both the teachings of the saints and the Catholic faith, neither was a proper nor could it have been made except by God himself. It is clear that the body of man was made by one and the same and equal divine power purely from nothing and from mud. The saints and the Catholic faith, the unanimous consent of the saints, the fathers, and the Catholic faith, the teaching of the church herself. And lastly, for right now, there are more, but Suarez, the great Jesuit theologian, he says that first, we must say that Adam was not produced ex nihilo as to the body, but was formed from the mud of the earth. This is certain from the aforesaid words of Genesis 2. Then he cites many other scripture passages, several fathers, um, explaining that mud is a mixture of dust and water. And then he says, secondly, we must hold that the body of Adam was immediately produced or formed by God alone. This thesis, we affirm, is Catholic doctrine. It is taught by St. Thomas in the Prima Pars, question 91, article 2, and where he proves it from Sirach 17.1, God created man out of the earth. In this concur the other fathers and theologians. And then he cites Chrysostom, Ambrose, Basil, Theodoret, Seal of Alexandria, Augustine, Hilary, and Athanasius. And that's not an exhaustive list. We could list dozens of other fathers and theologians here. We'll see them in a minute. But we don't have the time, and frankly, my Latin's not that great to translate all of them. <laughs> but remember how I was said earlier that a unanimous consent is more evident from the views that are rejected following Fenton. Now, we're going to look at two here, um, the only ones that are really noted. First, origin. Now, what exactly he said is a little disputed. Um, there's a lot of controversy over his writings, what he said or supposed to have said, but the fathers at least interpret him as holding that man's soul was made prior to his body. That Adam and Eve were not made with physical bodies, but with spiritual bodies. And that we only receive physical corporeal bodies after the fall. And that's how he interprets Genesis 3.21 saying where God says God 
clothed Adam and Eve with garments of skins. He interprets those as our physical bodies. So he has this very allegorical, spiritual interpretation, very like, no matter, like matter's bad. At least he's reported to have held that. Now we don't have time to look at all the fathers saying so, but Cornelius Alapide hits it home for us in his very first canon on the correct interpretation of the Pentateuch. He says, Since Moses here writes the history of the world, it is clear that his narration is not symbolic, nor allegorical, nor mystical, but historical, simple, and plain. And hence those things which he narrates about paradise, Adam, Eve, the creation of all things completed in the space of six days successively, etc., are to be received historically and properly as they sound. This is against Origen, who thought to explain all these things allegorically and symbolically, and therefore he destroyed the letter and the literal sense. All the other fathers and the church hand down our true canon, which condemns this allegory of Origen. So that's pretty unanimous. There's a lot to unpack there. Wish we had time to. Fast forward a thousand years to Cardinal Cajetan. Now, he was a great theologian in his own right, but as St. Alphonsus Liguori says, his commentaries on scripture have been greatly censured. One reason is his rejection of the literal interpretation of what is narrated about Eve's body. He sees a contradiction. So either Adam had to have a superfluous rib to start with, and then he was left, or he was down a rib after the fact and was left mutilated and neither of which he sees as compatible with God's perfection, and so he calls them absurd and takes a more allegorical or mystical reading. Um, now, it's an important question, and theologians have proposed various answers to that, but they all reject it. Cardinal Cajetan's allegorical interpretation, says uh, Joseph Pohl, of this text has been unanimously rejected by theologians as fanciful and unwarranted and a couple of them even call it heretical. This is one of the reasons why the tradition is much stronger with regard to Eve's formation. Um, also the Council of Vienne, which I wish we had time to get to. So what does this all mean? We see the fathers and theologians expressly rejecting a non-literal, non-historical reading of the creation of our first parents and of Genesis 2 in general. And as I mentioned, this is just the beginning. Since we don't have time to look at them, here's just a list of the fathers and theologians that I have found who support, in one way or another, in their own way, our thesis that Adam was made by God from the dust, from the mud. And the ones in bold, of course, are doctors. And then from later authors. I actually ran out of space on this slide. The, un the unanimity is so profound. Just like everyone I turn to, they all say the same thing. Adam was formed by God from the earth, from the dust, from the mud, the clay. It's always the same. That same sense. They all explain it, their own little nuances, but it's always the same. This indicates, especially in light of the Pontifical Biblical Commission's 1909 decree, where it says that we cannot call into question the historical character of Genesis 1 to 3, particularly on the matter of the special creation of man and the formation of the first one from the first man, particularly in light of that, and in light of the fact that Pius X said that that's binding under pain of mortal sin, it seems that the sense in which the church has held and holds the Genesis 2 narrative regarding our first parents is the literal, historical, and plain sense one. Our first parents were formed immediately by God, Adam from the earth, and Eve from his side. So what have we seen so far? We've seen that a doctrine has been... is taught by the church as divinely revealed. It's a dogma. Um, when it's proposed for our belief in scripture and tradition, when it's revealed there, and it's proposed by the church for our belief as revealed in our ordinary in universal magisterium or in our extraordinary magisterium. And the ordinary and universal magisterium is manifest by the unanimous consent of the fathers and theologians. We've also seen that scripture is explicit and tradition is unanimous. Adam was made by God alone, immediately, no secondary causes. And the material from which God made Adam immediately was mud, dust mixed with water, also called clay, or just earth, broadly speaking. 
And we've seen that the non-historical interpretations are explicitly and unanimously rejected. So let's draw all this together. It, this seems to meet the requirements given infallibly by the First Vatican Council for Catholic dogma. And therefore, a contrary teaching, a contrary sense of the doctrine, say, for example, an evolutionary origin for Adam's body, is, in the proper technical sense, heretical. We'll pause there, and we'll pick back up in part two, and we'll examine briefly how theologians in the 19th century respond to evolutionism and see how they confirm what we found here. But we'll also see that they were ignorant of certain very important texts, which, if they had known, it might have significantly bolstered their arguments. Let us thank God for having provided us so great a cloud of witnesses of his revealed truth, so that we may take comfort in the supernatural certitude of our faith in the face of the enemies of God and his church. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen.